They say life is stranger than fiction. Things like lithium, um, potassium, uh, sodium, they could be chewed and then produce a gas that's flammable, potentially. But sometimes what we see in movies or read in books is so incredible that it obviously couldn't be possible. Or could it? The experiment I'm thinking of is 2017, uh, where some scientists did this with a photon and they transferred it between a, a lab on Earth, obviously, uh, to a satellite in orbit. Welcome to Sci-Fi Sci-Fact. I'm Brian Crump, and this is a podcast where we take science fiction's strangest ideas, weirdest elements, most unfeasible plot drivers, and explore if they could actually happen in real life. Maybe they already have. And in every episode, we bring in a scientist from New Zealand's McDiamond Institute to explain the theories behind some of fiction's more fantastic flights of fancy. If any theory exists. Generations have passed. The people of Pern have returned to a time of lordships and warlords. Technology which had been lost for centuries, now being rediscovered. And with it, the seduction of power. Conflict and deceit embrace the planet. The noble rule of the Dragon Riders is challenged. Their very existence under siege as they travel the hero's journey, astride humanity's last line of defense, Dragon Riders of Pern. This week's Sci-Fi Sci-Fact is brought to us by Professor Nicola Gasson, McDiamond Institute co-director and professor of physics at Auckland University. And I reckon this phrase might sum it up, or at least be a, a, a suitable introduction, and that is, there be dragons. What do you think of that, Nicola? <laughs> well, there indeed, there be dragons, um, sometimes. Dragon Riders of Perm is, is the book you've chosen. And I'm pretty sure that we talked a little bit about, I don't know whether it was the difference between science fiction and, and science fantasy, but or, or at least fantasy writing, but I do think I asked you about early examples of, of science fiction. And you've been thinking about that, haven't you? Yes. Well, um, I think that was a conversation we had just before Christmas, Brian. And then over Christmas, I was um, reading with my um, young nephew. And he's um, kind of enthusiastic about dragons at the moment. So we, we started a new series about uh, dragons. And um, so that took me a little bit back to this um, series because I think you'd asked me in that interview before Christmas what my sort of formative experiences of, of science fiction were. And I, I came up with a, a few examples maybe, but I was I was thinking it about it a bit. And I think The Dragon Riders of Pern, which is a, a, a set of books um, by Anne McCaffrey, that I would have started reading when I was intermediate age, I think, is kind of a good example of something that I found particularly interesting um, because of all the different ways that it intersects with both science fiction and fantasy. I mean, dragons, fantasy, I mean, they're is such a key part of fantasy. They're almost a cliche fantasy, aren't they? <laughs> They're, they're canonically fantastical, yes. Um, and so I, I don't really want to defend dragons as science fiction per se. I don't think that's um, particularly useful. Um, and definitely this series of books, um, it, it kind of gets at that in a clever way because it starts out being completely a, a fantastical um, set of uh, stories. Um, you know, a, a sort of feudal slash medieval society with people who ride dragons um, to, to what, save What do they always the hang out in medieval societies? That's what I mean. Dragons, they could be anywhere. They could be in any time zone. But they yeah, always yeah. hang out. They always seem to hang out where there's kings and queens and feudal lords and, and ladies. 
I, I think, well, this is just part of them being um, canonically fantastical, I think. This, this, that is the, the very obvious setting. I, I think there have been some creative exceptions made in the, in the literature since, but Look, like Godzilla. But it starts out very much drawing on that fantastical um, basis. And it's only sort of slowly through the series of books that you're introduced to the fact that actually um, this planet that the dragons exist on is a planet that has been settled by human beings um, who've come from a sufficiently technologically advanced society to settle on the planet in the first place. And then they've lost all of that technology um, because of a particular threat that the planet poses to them. Um, and so they haven't been able to retain much of the technology that they arrived with, um, but they've found this local solution to that lack of technology, which is that these dragons naturally existed on this planet to begin with. And so dragons as aliens, um, it's perhaps the only context in which dragons start to make sense as science fiction rather than uh, purely as fantasy. So maybe on some planet, in some sort of atmosphere, some sort of chemical composition of life, it wouldn't be extraordinary to breathe fire and be able to fly and be quite big. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's that's kind of what I found, I think, interesting about the whole conceit of the series, that it starts out purely fantastical and then it introduces reasons for you to start to believe that hmm, this isn't so implausible. Uh, the dragons are actually fed something, uh, a form of rock or ore that they have to chew in order to produce flame. So there's some sort of chemical reaction that's going on. And so that's sort of introduced in a in a sensible way that seems um, physically plausible. And then um, once you get back into the origin story of the settlement on the planet, the uh, the dragons, it turns out, were originally very small, so about the size of a cat, um, uh, but were genetically engineered by the settlers to become large enough so that people could ride on them. So that's the premise. Um, and those aspects are sort of kind of scientifically plausible. I mean, the idea of genetically engineering things to be larger, um, whether or not you approve of that is something that's certainly been applied to food crops um, in various forms of, um, of agriculture. So yeah, genetically engineering something to be larger, sure. Um, the idea that, that a, a, a biological species might be able to chew on something that produces a chemical reaction that produces itself as flame. Um, yeah, you, know I think what those, that, you know what I was thinking of just then, Nicola, is, is the plausibility hmm. of an animal, an organic being, getting its energy from, from fossil fuel, from directly from oil or oh. coal or gas. I mean, what if, we could, what if you could eat coal and digest it and get the energy you needed by doing that? I'm Sorry to throw that into the mix. This wasn't a question I'd prepared for, no. but yes, I think in principle <laughs> that would be possible. Uh, in principle, it would be, yeah. I mean, it doesn't sound to me like the rock that the dragons in Dragon Riders of Pern, uh, <laughs> they're not chewing coal or even coke. No, I think, I think it would be some sort of rock that has metallic components that um, spontaneously combust when they combine with oxygen, for example. Things like lithium, um, potassium, uh, sodium. Yes. They're not uncommon metals and they're, they're, they're very, well, they're not uncommon metals, but they're very rare in metallic form on this planet um, simply because we have an oxygen atmosphere. So the idea that in rock form they could be chewed and then produce a gas that's flammable, potentially. There's no sense that the dragons are chewing something that's radioactive in the series. No, no, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure there's nothing that would make me think that. So in in the series, the oh. the dragon riders themselves, the settlers, is it pretty clear that they're human, like you and me? Yeah, it's pretty clear that they're human. Um, and so I should probably unpack a little bit the premise of the whole um, situation because it, it's probably hard to understand quite how central the dragons are to the story. Um, we'll get on to the other aspects of the dragons in a second. Um, but essentially the society arrives on this planet and uh, they've, they've arrived because it's been surveyed and it's been assessed as being fit for human life. 
Um, but of course, that survey was uh, performed over a, a limited time scale. So when they actually arrive and they, they settle and they're, I think, maybe there for a few years before the problems start, um, everything looks fine until there's a sort of um, plague that arrives from the sky in the form of something that they call thread, which is described as both sort of metallic in character and living. So it devours everything alive. So it, it burns human beings or, or devours all the vegetation on the planet. And so this actually starts to be set up in a, in a quite scientifically plausible way, which is I think where the, the series really converts in my mind from fantasy to science fiction. Uh, there's a, a, a planet in, the, um, in the, the solar system that they're in that has a particularly elliptical orbit. It goes and passes through an Oort cloud on the edge of the solar system um, every so often, and then drags material that exists out in that cloud back towards the planet that they've settled on, on um, some sort of a cycle. I think it's every few hundred years and it lasts for about a 50 year period. So this, this so is not the planet that they're on. It doesn't go way out there into the Oort cloud. It's another planet no. that goes out and its gravity picks up some of this stuff called thread and brings it back into the path of the planet that the dragons and the humans, the settlers are living on. Exactly, Brian. Thank you so much for putting that more clearly than I did. Um, I think they refer to it as the red star in the books. It's a long time since I read them, but there we go. Um, and so it's, it's this red star that is a threat, that it brings this uh, plague of, of thread, which destroys life on the planet periodically. Um, and so in order to destroy this plague that arrives sort of intermittently, there's some sort of defined pattern, which is never explained in detail, but that obviously would be determined by the rotation of the planet and exactly the, the relationship between the orbits of these two planets, I suppose. Um, so this, this thread falls on the planet and the dragons um, are created because it's noted initially that these small dragons before they're genetically engineered can breathe flame. And flame is the only thing that destroys this, this thread before it falls on the planet. So, it is necessary for the whole um, purpose of the dragons that they be able to move quickly about the planet and that they breathe fire. The breathing fire is, I guess, canonical um, and explained by the chewing of this rock. But in order to move quickly about the planet enough, the dragons are required to teleport. <laughs> I don't know why I find that particularly amusing, but they what, like Star Trek? Yes. <laughs> Disappear from one place and turn up in another. Do the dragons do that themselves? Like, or yes. the, they do? They do. And so this is the, the slightly difficult thing about um, fact-checking this. If you just believe in dragons as fantastical, then you can kind of believe, it, well, you can you can get logically with a suspension of belief to the idea that the dragons then teleport. But um, but because the whole premise has now moved onto a science fiction standpoint with this introduction of planets and, and a, a physical origin of this threat, this thread, um, the teleportation, I think, then needs to be considered um, from a uh, through a science fiction lens as well. I'm guessing I'm also wondering why the dragons obviously quite clever, would allow themselves to be domesticated, but maybe I'm misunderstanding the relationship between them and the settlers, allow the humans to domesticate them so that they can ride them, but yet they are the ones who do the teleporting. It's like, wouldn't the dragons just say, we're smart enough to teleport, you humans aren't, we're not going to be your slaves? So that's that's a good critique, and I guess it's not one that really occurred to me when I was you know, twelve and started reading this <laughs> <No. scroll. laughs> um, So the the dragons are also telepathic. I was going to leave that till later after we talked about the teleportation. Really, um, but they are telepathic. So they this do. makes it even more like like they can they can they can read. Can they read our minds or just each other's minds? Um, they, I think they they can communicate directly with a human being and then with each other as well. Right. So, so again, they, they, they've, got, they've got, you know, digital communication down pat naturally. Uh, and yes. you would think that they'd be writing us, not the other way around. 
but we probably wouldn't be useful. Well, this kind of gets to my my issue with the teleportation because teleportation itself is a um, as a science fiction device is used in lots of different contexts, and you can sort of talk about it um, in the context of modern experiments in quantum mechanics, which provides for the idea of you know, spooky action at a distance, which can sort of lead you into thinking about teleportation. Um, and there's, there's sort of, there are scientific experiments that talk about teleportation of quantum particles. Um, and so that part, you know, I, I can sort of work my way up from very basic principles towards something that looks like teleportation existing in some alien species on an alien planet. But there are a couple of things I get stuck on. Before I, I talk um, about those sticking points, just remind us of a very basic um, refresher in quantum mechanics, the idea hmm. that a particle couldn't be in two places at once, which I think is what we base the possibility in real life of teleportation on. Superpositioning, is that, have I got that right? It's, it's sort of right, Brian. It's a little bit more specific than that. So it's, it's more about this um, phenomenon of entanglement so that you can have two particles that are created together in a pair of states that are sort of, well, mutually dependent. And then you can take these two particles apart um, and you don't know which one has which state specifically, but you know that their, their states are entangled. So whatever the state of one of them is determines the state of the other. And so this, this can be done. And then the, the trick is that um, you kind of need a third particle to come in and you can measure the combination of its state with one of these two original states. Um, you can't measure one of the original particles on its own because that would just determine the state of the other particle, but you can measure a combination. And in doing that, because measurement in quantum mechanics can um, set the state that was previously undetermined into a specific state, uh, that will tell you that the state of the particle that you've measured in combination with something else, That's slightly awkward, maybe that way of explaining it, um, but that that effectively transfers the state of the particle that you had to its entangled particle, which can be somewhere else. And that somewhere else could be a few feet away, sorry, meters, a, or yeah, a few million, possibly in theory, a few million kilometers away? In theory, yes. So I think um, the experiment I'm thinking of is 2017, uh, where some scientists did this with a photon and they transferred it between a, a lab on Earth, obviously, uh, to a satellite in orbit. And so that's just the, the quantum mechanical description of the photon. So basically what energy it has um, is, is largely how you might think of this. And photons can have a, a range of energies. And so by doing this, this setup and doing this sort of measurement of an entangled photon in some environment on Earth, you can transfer its state to this photon that's on a satellite in orbit. And you can, in doing that, obliterate the original um, state or the original, original energy of the photon that you had. So you change that, but you transfer it to this other photon in a very different place. Oh, really? So the energy went from Earth to satellite? Yeah, yeah, in some sense. And so it's not about moving the particle. It's just about moving the information that we have about the particle. But information is pretty important. Um, and the key thing quantum mechanically is that it's indistinguishable, the set of photons you have and their energies, to if you had transferred them from one place to another. And because it's indistinguishable, it turns out to be effectively as though you had teleported it. I had no I didn't know we'd managed to do that. How come they didn't hit the news headlines? <laughs> oh, I think it hit a few news you headlines. Must have. But... I mean that's 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 big cheese. That's beam me up, Scotty, isn't it? Well it is it is just a photon. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you know, one photon, um, small yeah. baby steps. We can, we can do this with 
atoms, at least I've seen some evidence of um, atoms that have had um, partial transfers of yeah, sets of atoms that have had um, their information transferred. So this is a, a real thing, but it's very much about information transfer rather than exchanging physical objects. And so it's almost more like you've got some sort of high speed quantum Wi-Fi process going on rather than what we think of as physical teleportation. Might it be more um, practical for communication, the transfer of information as in the information, you know, that we read uh, or digital information yeah. as opposed to a physical thing? Personally, yes, I think so. Um, I don't think it's really going to um, have legs as it um, as it goes when it comes to <laughs> biological things. <laughs> um, or even breathe the, fire. No, I don't, I don't think it'll breathe fire either. Um, and that's partly because we know a lot of things about um, the quantum mechanical properties of molecules. For example, um, yeah, molecules interact when they get into um, large quantities, and especially when they're in biological systems, they're interacting with each other all the time. And so this was actually something that was addressed in um, quite a famous paper um, by um, Anderson back in science in the 70s called More is Different, talking about what happens when you have lots of matter interacting and how the properties change, even quantum mechanically. Uh, and so you have molecules that might exist in, say, a left-handed form and a right-handed form. And these are things like amines, which exist in biology everywhere, sugars, which exist in biology in plenty of places. And they explain um, the fact that you have left-handed and right-handed forms is kind of why DNA has a particular right-handed helix rather than being wrapped around the other way. And so what quantum mechanics would tell you is that you should always have a combination of those two things because the left-handed and right-handed form should have the same energy and the energy determines the state in quantum mechanics. And because the two energies should be the same, you have a symmetry. And so you should always have something that can be both, it can be left-handed or right-handed. But in biological systems, of course, we don't see this. We see, I think it's what, yeah, the right-handed um, helix and, and sugars and left-handed amino acids is, I think, the right way around. Um, and so that's actually a little bit of a quantum mechanical conundrum that mm. was pointed out. But of course, the answer is that when molecules start interacting with each other, a lot of those symmetries are lost and you get something that yeah, behaves more in, in more of a regular way and more of a um, in, in a less special way than, than it would purely according to quantum mechanics. And so I think that's the same... Um, with these kinds of uh, entanglement, uh, entangled states that you need for teleportation. Uh, the more complex the object, the, the less likely you are to ever be able to, to do something like this. This has been a fascinating uh, detour. I'm talking sci-fi, sci-fact with Nicola Gaston from the McDermott Institute. And she's talking about the, the science behind the dragons of Dragon Riders of Pern series of books by Anne McCaffrey, which feature dragons. Uh, dragons that uh, not only breathe fire, um, they they can also they're also telepathic and they can teleport. Now you said quite some time ago now, Nicola, that there are a couple of snags in the teleportation thing, um, and oh, then yeah. I asked and you about quantum mechanics. And so, shall we go back to those snags? <laughs> so the second one. So the first one is just that quantum mechanically, um, we know that complex molecular systems don't behave in the same way as very simple atomic systems that have defined quantum mechanical states. So that's that's sort of the first practical snag. Um, the second one though, is that even if, you know, that if, we're, if we're accepting that these um, dragons are alien beings and therefore that they might have some funny mechanism that might get over some of these issues, uh, that's a big might, but I, I, for, the, for the sake of the thought experiment, we can go there. Um, I still have a really big issue with if it's an innate property of their cells and their physiology, how on earth when they teleport are they going to carry a rider with them? Ah. So that's actually a bigger snap yeah. that occurs to me. That just doesn't make any difference. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, the humans, and with, which brings me back to why would they bother with the humans in the first place, you know? 
Um, they well, seem to be offering us. Do they like us, these dragons? Well, they do, I think. Um, I'm not really sure why, but maybe just because they're nice creatures. Um, I think because when they hatch, they get to meet humans as they hatch, and so they they become attached in a way. Um, I think that's the premise, but I'm not really sure why they like us in this yes. whole you know, that's a, But that's an interesting, another potential science fiction um, uh, uh, meme. I, can't, I don't think that's the right word, but it's the one that came into my head. Blame the internet. And, and that is, imagine beings that are super intelligent, yet are emotionally dependent on others that aren't so smart. In other words, we humans have pets that are really smart, but they're, they're like dogs, so they, they, they bond to us, and they'll do what we say, even though they're smarter than us. That's sort of psychological kind of sci-fi, but that just came into Ooh. my head just then. I think that that could take you all sorts of places and, and possibly nowhere very good if you really explored that one. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it would be trouble. Mm. And anyway, um, back to the... Actually, no, the other thing you... So the dragons, it's interesting, because really we're talking about two things in in the Dragon Riders series, that the, the dragons, but then the thread, the stuff that comes from space that burns everything except the, the, the dragons, they can they can get rid of it, but they have to teleport to get there in time. Now, what possibly could, I mean, lots of things, let's face it, I mean, we came from space, didn't we? We are all star stuff, but um, what could threaten us now out there? Is there anything that might be out there that we might one day just wander into planet Earth and get into deep trouble? I'm not talking about big things smashing into us, but something like this that we couldn't really see so easily. Yeah. Um, oh, things that would actually be super destructive. Um Oh, I don't know. Antimatter is the first one that comes to mind. <laughs> Antimatter. If it meets, <laughs> no, what happens? What? Okay, and that's another great science fiction vehicle. What is antimatter? Very briefly, and why might it be bad for us? Well, antimatter is just the opposite of the matter that we have. We talked about symmetry before in terms of left-handed and right-handed molecules, and antimatter is just if you had atoms which had negatively charged nuclei and positively charged um positively charged particles instead of the electrons which would be called positrons and so this is um absolutely viable you'd have the same kind of atomic structure the same kind of energetics of binding the same kinds of uh the same periodic table uh, with these opposite charges and um and these particles can be created right they, we know that they can exist um positrons are, um, are possible um so is there any evidence yeah, however that, that, that there's a lot of antimatter in the cosmos now yeah well well we might think that once upon a time there was some antimatter there's no reason that it mightn't have existed um but if of course antimatter comes into contact with what we know as regular matter these days if you bring a positron and an electron together they'll just obliterate each other. They'll just come together and then both of them will cease to exist. So antimatter, when you talk about um, unknown threats out there, that's probably the one that my mind goes to first. I would have thought that if there was a lot of antimatter around, it would have met its maker, or in other words, opposite, <laughs> and already blown up quite some time ago. Well, that's, that's I guess, the possibly one of the assumptions is that that's why we don't see it anymore because at some point there was a um there's been more more of um what we know as regular matter than the other sort and that that has somehow self-perpetuated through being um being dominant being the dominant form of matter that we observe is there a possibility that um there could be a concentration of gas sufficient that if we if it was in the path of our planet, it could, it might be a toxic gas that might, is it, is that possible? Well, gases would tend to disperse pretty quickly in space because it's a vacuum. So I'm not really sure what would keep a gas together. Yes, that's in right. Yeah. Condition. Yeah. Um, whereas this, in, in the, the Pern story, it's very much this cloud that has some, some um, basically what's described almost as a liquid metal or it, it is presumably a, a solid metal, um, solid metal um, droplets, and in, in while it's in space, 
but as it falls on the planet, it melts. And so it's liquid when it hits the ground. And that is kind of more plausible to me because it would be relatively inert in space. Um, you could have these, these little bits of, I guess it's almost like, like a sort of dust um, that's formed of metallic elements. And um, so that, that kind of, I don't know, somebody out there will tell me I'm, I'm wrong, but it, it doesn't sound too implausible that you could have something that's metallic and relatively frozen, um, maybe produced by the explosion of a, of a um, star that's gone supernova, which is when you make these heavy metallic elements anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what would form it. Could exist way out on the edge of the solar system. There's a planet that's got a very elliptical orbit that goes out, gathers some of it, mm. brings it back on a, mm. on a regular once every, what, 100, 200, 300 or 400 year basis. Um, yeah, something like that. And dumps it in the path of, of the planet that um, the settlers and the dragons live on. Um, so I guess that, that seems plausible, provided that the dust out there on the edge of the, that's the solar system isn't going to do what any gas would do, and that is disperse. Yeah, so the, 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 the point of it being a cloud would have to mean that it, it sort of was produced by something and then it has sufficient stability to be lingering around um, due to whatever gravitational um, forces are about, I suppose. You know, the other yeah. thing that, that I, I wondered about that is a threat that's all around us in terms of the planet Earth is, is radiation from the sun and actually from mm. the wider cosmos and our magnetic field protects us from that, doesn't it? But if we didn't have that magnetic field, we'd be in deep doo-doo, wouldn't we? We would be, but that would be more about you know biological molecules probably being sensitive to that radiation and therefore um, breaking up or, or being damaged, which would be, I think, the biggest immediate impact. In this case of these metal particles, I think what's interesting is that you can sort of imagine them melting as they fall on the planet. But then there are two things. One is that they have to be burnable, and it's maybe not obvious that metal particles are burnable um, but that I think I can I can suggest a couple of cases where it would work um, but then when they hit the ground they have to eat all the vegetation that's there and sort of consume everything that's living as though they were living themselves and that I sort of the the description of this thread as being itself alive in the books is the thing that I can't really get my head around having a metallic substance that's alive. Um, but I think... Doesn't that depend on, on how we define life? I mean, life could be... We, life could have... Yeah. If, 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 if chemical... If molecules can reproduce themselves, make copies of themselves, does it matter in what form what the molecules are? All that matters is that it, 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 they reproduce and carry on, and maybe as they adapt, they actually... It's not by chance they start to, ad to create adaptations which, which allow them to keep copying themselves. Isn't that life or my way off beam here? But that you, you are exactly right. And so that would be my reason for saying that this metallic stuff thread is not alive in the books because there's no suggestion that it replicates itself. It expands in volume. It sort of takes over as it eats. Um, but that's just the absorption of material, I think, the, the fact that it's just sort of growing. I don't think that really sets um a meets the condition for life in my opinion so i'm relatively comfortable that it could just be a complex liquid metal that is you know able to be burnt in the atmosphere but possibly is activated in the atmosphere because it would be reacting already with oxygen for example and so it might fall to the ground as a very corrosive oxide of a reactive metal that would then uh, react very vigorously with water or with any living substance that had water in it. So I, I can actually imagine that that part of the narrative could be um, could be possible. How come it doesn't kill the dragons? Well, it does. It does um, damage the dragons, so they can be burnt by a thread in the same way that any of the humans in the story can be. But of course, because they can teleport, they can dodge it. And I think they, they simply arrange themselves to burn it in the sky before it hits them, is the, the basic idea of the books. How, what aspect of, of 
of your scientific curiosity do you feel mm. was really um, sparked by the series by Anne McCaffrey? Um, was it honest, just the I whole think, thing? Yeah, I think it's actually the world building aspect of it, which is a, a perhaps the one thing that fantasy tends to do very seriously that where science fiction tends to build up from the things that we know about now. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of world building in fantasy that is particularly interesting in the way that actions by the characters can disrupt or change um, what is known. The, um, the idea actually that people settled on this planet and that technology was lost rather than gained, that that sort of inversion of what we often think of in, in science fiction is that it's this technologically advanced society somewhere in the future. But the idea that you're, you're, you're working in a, in a science fiction narrative, but that society is less developed and doesn't have access to even technologies that we have access to now, I think possibly that was the, the aspect that most got me about the whole series. And as a scientist, see, you work with a lot of information. There's a lot of empirical work involved in science. I mean, you have to, to, to back up any hypothesis that you might have with empirical evidence. But yet mm -hmm. the actual act of creating a new idea, maybe the idea that you just put aside the rules that as we know them, and imagine something completely different is one mm. way of approaching a problem? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, it's, it's, it's tricky because it's, it's easy to over-romanticise the science that was done 100 years ago that to, to sort of say, oh, it was so much easier to find out meaningful things and certainly the development of quantum mechanics as, as part of science would be a, an example of where people tend to say that. But... but um, yeah, I think the, the more that we are willing to sit down and look at things from first principles without sort of using the, the quick um, shortcuts, I suppose, that, that we tend to get used to in science, the jargon that takes us from one place to another that says, okay, well, all metals are like this or um, other things are like that. Um, yeah, the more we can sit and, and think a little bit creatively about what could be possible in some other situation, the more, um, yeah, the more we're receptive, I think, to, to actually seeing when there are surprises in the data that we're observing empirically. And here comes my last question, getting back to the telepathic, not the telepathic, actually, the teleporting dragons. See, even if we could, we could teleport physical material, not just, not just photons, not just or information, um, mm. if we could, how would we be able to transfer consciousness? You know, I mean, if you could beam a human yeah. from, from the Earth to a satellite, yeah, but, and recreate the atoms of the human, but what about the human's consciousness? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a big thing in all this, Brian. I think um, the consciousness part, I mean, to an extent, I, I guess I, I figure it's it's encoded somewhere in the particular electronic states in um, the atoms that make up neurons in our brains, et cetera. Um, and if you could reproduce all of that perfectly, that perhaps you would have the same consciousness. But, but yeah, I, I think it would have to be a perfect replica and any small changes would perhaps make that invalid i don't know i don't i um i think it sounds well, think like a great vehicle <laughs> a great but wouldn't it be a great vehicle for a science fiction series somebody who repeat how people who regularly teleport start to um lose their minds so to speak oh or even i i can sort of imagine it right people teleporting as a way to actually get to um other planets that are, are too far away to travel to in real time and um, arriving, but without any knowledge of who they were. <laughs> I, um, what am I doing yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, yes. Nicola, it's been fascinating talking with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Brian. I always enjoy it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sci-Fi, Sci-Fact, hosted by me, Brian Crump, 
produced by Andrew Robertson, and of course, made possible thanks to the incredible knowledge of those brilliant scientists at the McDiarmid Institute. You can find more episodes of Sci-Fi Sci-Fact on the RNZ Podcasts page. RNZ Podcasts are also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or pretty much wherever you might find your podcasts. And make sure to follow us so you don't miss out on any new episodes. <laughs>